Thank you, Dave. I was uh, particularly pleased to uh, be invited to uh, present to this workshop uh, because of the uh, great support the Landsat program has uh, received from the Western States uh, water management community, and I'll expand on that a, a little bit uh, further into the presentation. To avoid confusion, Landsat 8 and the Landsat Data Continuity Mission, or LDCM, refer to the same, exactly the same satellite. Uh, for uh, hysterical or historical reasons, uh, NASA has uh, retained the uh, title LDCM. Uh, USGS assures me that they will rename the satellite Landsat 8 when they take over operations following launch. So I'm also pleased to be here because I have uh, mostly good news, or only good news. Um, as you're aware, I'm sure the uh, Landsat program is now 40 years old. Uh, a series of eight satellites have been launched, or seven satellites have been launched, uh, with the eighth uh, LDCM or Landsat 8 uh, on schedule to launch early next year. Uh, this summer, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the launch of the first Landsat satellite on July 23, 1972. So uh, the Landsat program uh, and Landsat 8 is a NASA USGS partnership. NASA leads the development and launch of the satellite observatory. Observatory is a jargon. It means the satellite plus its payload. Uh, and USGS leads uh, the development of the ground system that will uh, command and control the spacecraft and receive and manage the data. And they will take responsibility for post-launch operations after we check out uh, the satellite following launch. So project status. Launch. Uh, I'm, I'm giving my um, punchline uh, first. Uh, Landsat 8 is on schedule for a, February 11th, for a February 11th launch. And the joke is, what year when you talk to NASA people? 2013. Uh, it will be launched on an Atlas V uh, 401 launch vehicle uh, that was built by the United Launch Alliance uh, at their facility near Huntsville, Alabama. And the launch will be from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, visiting the uh, United Launch Alliance facility a couple weeks before the, um, uh, the launch vehicle shipped. And they gave me a Sharpie, so I signed the, uh, the lower stage. That, that's an aerospace joke. Uh, not really. Um, but the lower stage arrived uh, on a very large airplane called an Antonov AN-124. Arrived at Vandenberg on August 27th. And the upper stage of the launch vehicle, which is called a Centaur, arrived on September 14th in a, in a van. And um, moving on, this is the Integrated Satellite Observatory uh, currently uh, in testing at the Orbital Sciences uh, Corporation facility in Gilbert, Arizona. The two instrument payload, ooh, that's, a, that's a dull, I'm gonna step away. The two instrument payload is up here. This is the operational land imager, and this is the thermal sensor called the thermal infrared uh, sensor, it's here. Uh, a, this is what we call the spacecraft plus. Uh, it, it was built by Orbital Sciences there in Gilbert. So the observatory is in the final phases of testing at Orbital Sciences. It successfully completed uh, electromagnetic interference and EMC, uh, electromagnetic compatibility testing uh, in August. This is a chamber. Whoops, that was not supposed to happen. This is the chamber uh, in which the um, uh, the radiation testing uh, went on in at Orbital. Uh, this simply means that um, the um, the satellite is uh, irradiated with electromagnetic radiation at specific facilities. Uh, all the systems are turned on, and you just make sure it works, and none of the systems um, interfere with each other uh, electrically. Uh, it also successfully completed dynamics testing. In September, dynamics testing, they put it on a vibration table and shake it uh, in three axes to ensure that the satellite will uh, stay together and remain functional following uh, the stress of a launch. 
Uh, they also put it into an acoustics chamber with the uh, biggest woofers uh, I've ever seen, uh, and that uh, and and turn on turn up the volume, and ensure that the satellite will work after it's exposed to the the noise of launch. Uh, you know, no, it's not. But I I kind of like I. I envision them having a stereo system behind the behind the chamber. It would be uh, pretty pretty awesome. Uh, so the final phase of testing began on Saturday. We put the um, each component and then finally the integrated spacecraft into a big uh, cylinder, pump all the air out, uh, and then um, simulate the environment of space where as the satellite orbits it goes through a, a warm period while it's uh, orbiting over the solar illuminated part of the earth and then goes through a cold period when it's on the other side of the earth and we cycle uh, the satellite through uh, hot and cold to uh, ensure that after we launch that the satellite can uh, survive the harsh, harsh environment of space and that's the last major hoop that the that all the systems have to go through before the satellite is shipped to Vandenberg Air Force Base and we're currently on schedule to do that in September. Okay, that was, here we go, there, wrong button. Okay, so, um, TIERS, uh, this is the thermal infrared sensor. It was added to the payload late, very late in the development of uh, Landsat 8. And uh, it would not, whoops, I did it again. It would not have been added to the payload without the support of the Western States Water Managers uh, through the leadership and in the organization of the Western States Water Council. I can say that unequivocally. Uh, I had personally failed to convince NASA management of the importance of continuing thermal imaging uh, on Landsat 8. And um, it wasn't a uh, position or decision that I was uh, comfortable with at all. And uh, through the history of the Landsat program, it reached a certain point of time uh, that there was an opportunity to um, reinstate the requirement for thermal imaging. Uh, the support of Western States Water Managers was timely in that the um, advocacy that Tony described uh, was not only effective, it came at the right, right time, and NASA management, because of that advocacy, decided to add this instrument to the payload. Uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center built and tested this instrument in-house, and they did so on a remarkably short schedule so that it was, it was put together under the leadership of a, an engineer and instrument manager at Goddard named Kathy Richardson. Uh, they worked uh, day and night. They worked through uh, uh, Christmas, uh, the holiday season. They worked through an earthquake when, when Tears was in uh, its thermal vac chamber at Goddard going under testing. An earthquake occurred at, at uh, in the Washington DC area, they had to shut down and then restart the thermal vac testing. Uh, it was a really a remarkable accomplishment uh, for which, you know, I'm very proud of my center for uh, being able to do that. Did it again? Um, so I, because of time, I'm not going to uh, go into a lot of detail about the instrument, uh, but this is what we call the beauty shot. This is the, this is the uh, TIERS instrument before it was shipped to orbital. It was shipped in uh, February of uh, this year. Um, just to the, the cogent points about TIERS, it's going to collect two bands of thermal data with a 100 meter um, spatial resolution. The, oh, oh, and there's another instrument. Uh, metric also uses, and, and uh, other um, evapotranspiration uh, models also use data from the uh, reflective portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, the operational land imager will continue the collection of data from those portions of the spectrum. Uh, Ball OLI, or operational land imager, was built by Ball Aerospace and Technology Corporation under um, contract to NASA. 
and you can see that they really got started uh, on tiers or on OLI at least a, a full year before we began to work on tiers. This is the beauty shot for the operational land imager. These are the spectral bands. Uh, it will continue the collection of the spectral bands collected by the earlier Landsat sensors, the thematic mappers, and the enhanced thematic mapper plus. We have a couple new bands. Uh, one's in the blue, in the far blue. That's to uh, help people who study coastal waters uh, get at ocean color or, or chlorophyll content. In coastal waters, there's a band, band nine, that's in a wet water vapor absorption uh, feature in the atmosphere. That, the intent of that band is to show people where high cirrus clouds occur in their imagery uh, because that hasn't always been apparent in uh, data collected by the previous satellites. Nope, oh, I'll get it yet. Uh, the top level mission ops concept is the uh, Landsat 8 will be launched into a heritage uh, Landsat orbit. Data will be, still be uh, collected along the path row coordinate system so that it's highly compatible with the data from the earlier satellites. We're going to maintain rigorous calibration, and as Tom will tell you, uh, that uh, the data products from Landsat 8 will uh, also be distributed for free by USGS Arrows, consistent with their current data policy for all Landsat data products. So the takeaway messages I'd like to leave you with today is that we are on schedule for a February 11th launch date. Nominal operations will begin after a uh, checkout period of approximately 90 days. OLI and TIERS will provide the best Landsat data in the what I consider proud 40-year history of the program. Uh, because of the technologies we use to, um, uh, to design and build OLI and TIERS, uh, basically, the radiometric sensitivity be, will be uh, greatly improved over previous instruments. That means we'll have a much higher signal-to-noise ratio. That should um, aid uh, the application of metric and other um, ET models in, in getting even more accurate estimates of uh, ET rates. And tears would not be on the satellite without the support of your community. I, I can't overemphasize that. I was, I was there, I know. Uh, it, it was only because of you guys uh, coming forward. USGS Aeros will distribute, and then USGS Aeros will distribute the data products for free and continue the current data pro, uh, policy. So thank you. <laughs>